Hey people, it's Nias nice talking. So this is from CNN. This is some good news. Tulsa race massacre reparations. Lawsuit survives motion to deny and will move forward. Judge rules. The plaintiffs in a lawsuit seeking reparations for the 1921 Tulsa race massacre celebrated a judge's ruling on Monday when she allowed their case to move forward against after defendants sought a motion to dismiss the case. Judge Caroline Wall said the motion to dismiss was granted in part and denied in part, which essentially allows the case to proceed where it's unclear what will happen next, including details of a potential trial according to Michael Schwartz, one of the attorneys for the plaintiffs. The plaintiffs' attorneys pleaded Monday afternoon for the up Monday afternoon for the judge to allow the case to move forward so the survivors and descendants of victims for the massacre could have their day in court, potentially their last chance to get some semblance of justice. A packed courtroom in Tulsa erupted in cheers and applause at the judge's ruling, including the three remaining survivors who were all over 100 years old and were in the courtroom for the hours on hearing. I've never seen something like this happen, said Hughes Van Ellis, a 100-year-old survivor of the massacre who told CNN he never lost hope. That means it's going to change things. It's going to make people think. It's going to change. It's going to be better for everybody, says Ellis, who goes by Uncle Red. The lawsuit was filed in March 2021 and looks to not only set the record straight on what took place between May 31st and June 1st, 2021, but also creates a special fund for survivors and descendants of the massacre that left at least 300 black people dead and the once booming neighborhood of Greenwood destroyed. On top of that, attorneys for the plaintiffs are racing against the law. The three of their clients are more than 100 years old, including the 100-year-old Ellis, as well as Viola Fletcher and Leslie Benningfield Randall, who are both 107. Demario Solomon Simmons, an attorney for the plaintiffs, told CNN Monday he was involved in earlier litigation for the massacre in the early 2000s with Charles J. Ogletree and Johnny Cochran. Today's victory, he says, follows a long string of defeats. When you work on something for 20 plus years, you have defeat after defeat, you have client after client die. To know I have three living survivors that are here with me now, this feels like partial victory. It means everything, Solomon Simmons says. Judge Wall's decision making on Monday on the case, which has been 100 years in the making, means America could be held accountable for previous injustice and could lay the groundwork for similar cases in the future, Solomon Simmons said. It shows a precedent and a model of how you can organize a community, how you can organize your colleagues and partners throughout the nation, he said. This victory we've received is because of so many people working together from across this nation and building coalitions. Walking into the courtroom to a cheering crowd Monday, Solomon Simmons pleaded the case to move this trial forward. They've waited 300 plus years to have their day in court, Solomon Simmons said of the three survivors. I think he means 300 altogether. He argued the main point of this case is undoing the harm done by the defendants, argued there's no time limit on something that is having a continued effect. Injustice plus time does not equal justice, Simmons said. The lawsuit names 11 plaintiffs, including survivors and relatives, relatives of survivors. Seven total defendants are named, including the city of Tulsa, Oklahoma Military Department, and the Tulsa De Development Authority. And that's something that should be mentioned. It wasn't just a bunch of crazy citizens. The military, the police, and the state officials of Oklahoma and Tulsa all took part in this. This was a state-sanctioned act, act of genocide against the black residents of Tulsa. Six months after the lawsuit was initially filed, some defendants in the case, including the Board of County Commissioners and Tulsa Metropolitan Area Planning Commission, filed a motion to dismiss the defendants' opposition, including arguments that the case lacks standing because some plaintiffs have not proven they suffered concrete personal injury and that their alleged injuries could not be remedied by the court. A hearing was held in September, but no decision was made at the time. A judge gave the plaintiffs until January 31st to present new arguments and gave the defendants until March to respond. Solomon Simmons said, CNN has reached out to defendants for comment. We've asked for another hearing day because mother Viola Fletcher turns 108 on May 10th and we asked Judge War and we said, look, this issue needs to be resolved before this lady turns 108 years old. That's why she granted that hearing, he said. The lawsuit is also looking to officially declare the actions of that day and the century that followed created a public nuisance for their plaintiffs and their defendants as defined by Oklahoma law. The next steps after Monday's hearing would be the discovery stage or the gathering of more evidence, both attorneys told CNN. And that's why this is so uh, important. There's so much we don't know about the massacre. There's so much we don't know about the ongoing harm, Solomon Simmons said. John Tucker, who is representing the Tulsa Chamber, argued Monday that a charge of public nuisance can't address societal ills. And he quoted extensively from the November ruling where the Supreme Court, Oklahoma Supreme Court, reversed a district court decision that ordered Johnson & Johnson to pay $55 million to the state for its role in the opioid crisis. We hold the district court's expansion of public nuisance law went too far, Oklahoma Supreme Court Justice James Winchester wrote in his opinion at the time, adding that the state's public nuisance cannot be extended to the opioid pandemic. 
Tucker also argued that the massacre happened too long ago to warrant a charge of public nuisance. While the plaintiffs compared the massacre to an oil spill that has long-term effects, Tucker disagreed. He argued the massacre, which the plaintiffs called a triggering act, can't be likened to an oil spill that's still on the ground and causing harm, to which some people in the ground carry made sounds of disapproval. Tucker further argued it's a matter to be addressed by other branches of government, not the courts, and the judges would be overstepping the legislature's mandate by allowing this to go to trial. Race massacre's effect lingers, lingers 100 years later. There have been efforts in recent years to raise awareness about the massacre. The 2018 news that the victims' bodies might have been found, along with plot lines from two popular TV shows, HBO's Lovecraft Country and Watchmen, helped to reinvigorate interest in the dark period of American history. CNN and HBO have the same parent company. Many of the details about what happened that spring have been lost to time, though. Not lost, covered up. What is known is that Tulsa at the time had something most cities did not. The Greenwood District was a thriving black hub of commerce, home to multiple millionaires and about 300 black-owned businesses. It's colloquially known as Black Wall Street. It's funny how it has 300 black-owned businesses and there are 300 black people who die. It's almost like they were targeted, that all, like maybe one owner of a business each got killed. It's funny how the numbers seem to come up like that. The events leading up to the massacre began on May 30th, 1921, when Dick Rowland, a 19-year-old black shoeshiner, ran from an elevator in a downtown building after the elevator's teen operator let out a scream. Rumors of a rape then circulated. Rowland was arrested and the white Tolsons formed a lynch mob. Black Tolsons arrived at the jail to defend Rowland. Scuffles ensued, a gun went off, and as then Sheriff William McCullough told Literary Digest, all hell broke loose. The mob laid waste to about 35 blocks within 16 hours. And you notice how they seem to be all ready to go. They're not looking for one person and just killing a house. They go and destroy everything. It's almost like everybody was planning for this. They just were hoping for an opportunity. Again, it's funny how that works, that one uh, uh, incident sparks all this destruction. It couldn't have happened, in my view, unless somebody had been planning or hoping for this to happen. Historic photos show entire blocks gutted by flame and black people lying in the street. And there are actually photos you can see online, what do you call it, of postcards made of this, the way they did lynching postcards. Exacerbating matters were insurance companies that deny many claims for what today would be tens of millions in property damage, including the destruction of two black hospitals. They targeted a hospital. That was not an act of revenge against the perpetrator. That was to make sure that every black person that could be killed was killed. And 1,256 residences, according to the Greenwood Cultural Center, there is still no hospital in North Tulsa today, so that's 101 years that that hospital has never been rebuilt. That's so funny. What do you think about the generational wealth that was lost when Greenwood was lost? That Then I think people can step back and say, wait a minute, imagine if that happened to my great-grandparents. Solomon Simmons told CNN that makes Greenwood special isn't its destruction. Black communities have endured similar events throughout history. It's special because of the size and scope of the destruction. Especially because we have so much documentation, we have actual video, we have hundreds of pictures, we have hundreds of insurance claims that were not paid, and we have free living survivors, he said. If black people can't win this, how can we win? Well, anyway, I hope you've enjoyed that. Please comment, rate, share, and subscribe. If you'd like to support this channel, leave my cash up. If you want to follow me on Instagram, I'll leave that there as well. If you'd like to buy one of my t-shirts, I'll leave that there as well. I'm going to leave, I'm an affiliate for a box, I mean, champ boxes, so I'm going to leave that in the description and my backup channel. I don't know exactly how we can support any of the legal effort, but hopefully they might come away later. Anyway, please comment, rate, share, and subscribe. Peace.